Knowledge of diamine oxidase is an excellent clinical tool. Diamine oxidase can be measured in the serum, but we make it in the microvilli. Be because of this, diamine oxidase can serve as a marker of mucosal maturation. We can measure levels to tell how healthy our lining is given that it's made there, but we also have important clinical clues. In addition to being a marker of mucosal maturation, it's also the enzyme that degrades histamine. And what we know is that when this becomes low in people, it causes them to be reactive, reactive to many foods, and it's hard to put their finger on, reactive to many things in the environment. And what they see is that they don't come back with allergies or sensitivities, but they know something is wrong because they're reacting to so many things. So when we see this pattern in patients, we need to think of the diagnosis histaminosis and measure levels of diamine oxidase. It's not just academic in that we would now know why this is going on in their body, but there are many things that we can do to treat diamine oxidase, to improve levels, to cause someone to make more of the enzyme, and in so doing, being able to degrade histamine more and being able to control symptoms that are driven by histamine. When we want to think, when we think about the gut lining and when we think about what's happening in the body and when we think about establishing a good response to foods that we eat, we would often think about breastfeeding. And we would examine what is in breast milk that allows the microbiome to take over, that keeps us from being allergic, that makes us uh, more tolerant of the environment around us. One thing that's in breast milk are immunoglobulins, and this helps to prime the immune system. Other things in breast milk, it's high in cysteine, helping to build pools of glutathione. But also, there's diamine oxidase in breast milk. This drives the argument that diamine oxidase is something necessary in order to build a competent gut lining. And the reason for this is that while normally the predominance of diamine oxidase that we make is made in the microvilli, a different thing happens in a woman who's pregnant. When a woman is pregnant, her placenta makes very high levels of diamine oxidase. And the reason for this is that the placenta is one of the things that is uh, encoded for almost predominantly from the male gene pool. This is because when we procreate, the male gene is <clears throat> wants to make sure to protect progeny that's inside mom. So he makes a placenta that creates high levels of this diamine oxidase to be able to reduce inflammation. And the more we reduce inflammation, the more we decrease the risk of miscarriage. This same phenomenon is why the placenta will pull so many nutrients for the mom in order to protect progeny, in order to protect the baby. The placenta is there to make sure baby makes it onto planet Earth. Then we birth baby, we birth placenta, but high levels of diamine oxidase remain in circulation for the mom. And as she breastfeeds there at the beginning, this diamine oxidase is passed on to her child, helping to reduce histamine, decreasing inflammation in the gut, and another part of establishing a healthy gut lining, keeping us tolerant to the world around us. This study also talks about levels of diamine oxidase in breast milk. And this talks about when we see it low. So conditions where you'll see low diamine oxidase, this one talks about colicky babies. And when they looked at babies who had more colic compared to those who did not, what they found was that low levels of diamine oxidase were responsible. So what we know is that low levels of diamine oxidase will cause more disturbance in the gut, and this is seen right off the bat from a, a newborn. Uh, but we also know if you biopsy the lining of Crohn's patients, you'll see lower levels of diamine oxidase. Uh, we know that in allergies and sensitivities, you'll see lower levels of diamine oxidase. But anytime histamine is in overdrive, this is something that we should consider looking at. And also remember that higher levels of histamine does not just mean rashes and runny nose, but there are histamine receptors in the brain. There are histamine receptors in the heart. And so an abundance of histamine can set us up for problems in those areas as well, including conditions like depression or arrhythmias. So increasing levels of diamine oxidase can be important for many reasons. 
So when we get too much histamine relative to our amount of diamine oxidase, we'll have an excess of histamine, and this will cause symptoms that mimic an allergic reaction, but are not necessarily driven by IgE or IgG. Some of the symptoms that we want to consider, headaches, GI issues, stomach ache, colic, having more gas or diarrhea. Uh, we'll see low levels of diamine oxidase in, in Crohn's disease and different cancers, ulcerative colitis, and uh, even certain cancers. Headaches is a, a big one that we want to consider with diamine oxidase. Um, if somebody has migraines or if they have headaches around their period, uh, this can be due to low diamine oxidase levels and treating can give a patient much relief. We also know that when there are higher levels of histamine, it can push T cells and cause them to be overactive, so it's another part of autoimmunity. And so as we increase the levels of diamine oxidase, we will decrease the histamine that can drive many autoimmune conditions. This is a schematic of where histamine acts. And what you see is that we have histamine many places in the body, if you, or receptors many places in the body. If you draw your eyes to the lower left corner, you'll see symptoms that you would associate with higher levels of histamine, such as um, rashes, urticaria, flushing, a congestion of the nose, um, sneezing, a bronchoconstriction. That these are we are very familiar with, and these uh, would present like conventional allergies. However, also note that you see histamine receptors in cardiovascular system in the central nervous system, and so low levels of diamine oxidase can be related to being dizzy, having more headaches, more nausea, um, having um, uh, being awake at night, disrupting circadian rhythms, um, not controlling body temperature well. Um, this can cause more diarrhea, stomach cramps, uh, and even problems with the uterus. So one of the things that happens before our period is, of course, that progesterone would drop off, and this causes the lining to shed. And what we know is if progesterone drops too much, this is when women will have symptoms. They will have more headaches, more cramping, because progesterone has some anti-inflammatory properties. And so if it lowers too much, this is, can drive symptoms. However, it's not the only thing that drops off the week before our period. Diamine oxidase does as well. And so if you have a, a patient who's experiencing PMS and not responding to hormone balancing or increasing levels of progesterone, think about diamine oxidase. This too can be a reason for someone to be more symptomatic. So we make diamine oxidase mainly in the microvilli, <clears throat> but we also make high amounts in the placenta. And this is to keep uh, baby intact, to reduce the inflammation. And what we note is that when there's low diamine oxidase in pregnancy, this is uh, associated with being high risk. Diamine oxidase will drop during luteal phase, and this is a reason that women can have more symptoms. Um, if you ask women in a history, do you itch more before your period? Do you notice that you can't handle wine as well during this time because wine is full of histamines? This can be a clinical clue that their diamine oxidase is low. And so we can use it to understand why people are more allergic, why they're more reactive, but we can also use it as a marker of mucosal damage. What we know is that as diamine oxidase drops off, uh, what you can, what you'll, this, this, this happens when the microvilli becomes more damaged. So, in terms of being permeable, one way that can occur is through a, uh, is through a signal called zonulin telling tight junctions to open. However, it is not just zonulin that allows for gut-based permeability. You can also wear down the gut lining. A good example of this would be in something like overuse of NSAIDs. It can wear down the gut lining so much that one ulcerates. That's a very permeable gut 
However, it is not modulated by zonulin. It's not a zonulin-mediated leaky gut. So when we're evaluating leaky gut, we need multiple ways to look at it. And diamine oxidase tells us, do we have healthy, plumped up microvilli that are doing their job appropriately, like making uh, good levels of brush border enzymes as well as diamine oxidase. This also drives another point, and that point is that what we see clinically is as you work on the gut, as you build gut lining, you'll also see people have less uh, allergic reactions. And of course, one reason for that is as you're less permeable, less things leak through intact. And when less things leak through intact, there's less to excite the immune system. But in addition to that immune excitation, what we know is that as you build the gut lining, you produce more diamine oxidase. The more diamine oxidase you produce, the better you are at degrading histamine. And this is why we see people have symptoms of allergies and sensitivities get better, not just to foods, but even things in the environment when we work on gut lining. So reasons that we can have histamine excess, we can have allergies, mastocytosis, uh, bacteria can cause this, happens with um, different foods or alcohol, GI bleeds, but also because of a deficiency in diamine oxidase. These are the patients that will be very reactive to the environment around them, and if we test this and treat them, they can have much relief. Again, we make histamine in more places than just the skin or the lungs. Uh, histamine can affect us in the gut, in the lung, the skin, but also the heart, also the brain. And so this, uh, this lets us know that as we control histaminergic loads, we can improve things like cognitive function, depression and anxiety, sleep cycles, circadian rhythm, because histamine can be disruptive to all of those things. We produce diamine oxidase mainly in the small intestine, a bit in the colon, if you're pregnant in the placenta, and a small amount in the kidney. When we look at diamine oxidase supplementation, uh, it will often be sourced from uh, a, um, a bovine or from a porcine source, uh, and, and it's from porcine kidney that we can extract diamine oxidase and use it in our patients. In traditional Chinese medicine, there is a long history of using bits of placenta to treat allergies. And the reason for that, again, is because it's so high in levels of diamine oxidase. So when there's an abundance of histamine, it will cause more smooth muscle contraction, more vasodilation, increased permeability, mucus secretions, fast heart rate, and also arrhythmias. All of these things have the potential to respond to lowering the histaminergic load, and we can do that by increasing levels of diamine oxidase. This is a schematic that shows the primary ways that we break down histamine. To the left is diamine oxidase, degrading histamine, moving it out of the body. However, this is, while it's the predominant way we get rid of histamine, it's not the only way we get rid of histamine. Uh, we also methylate and methyltransferase over to the right helps to remove histamine from the body. So we can use therapies like escidental methionine to help lower histamine. And finally, we also acetylate histamine. To drive acetylation of histamine using higher levels of B5 will be helpful. And this is why you see that show up in terms of an allergy treatment. Clinically, uh, we see this play out as well. So in conditions like lupus, uh, there is an abundance of histamine driving that autoimmunity. And so what we know is there's a decrease in activity of N-methyltransferase in lupus and also lower levels of diamine oxidase, demonstrating that when there's an abundance of histamine, this can be a reason uh, for lupus eruptions. And as we lower the histamine, we can put the immune system back in balance and help conditions like lupus as well as other conditions of autoimmunity. There are foods that are higher in histamine, uh, and so an example of a higher histamine food is tuna. Often we would think of fish as being anti-inflammatory because of their omega-3 fatty acids, but uh, the uh, tuna can have higher amounts of histamine, so if you have a patient that is more reactive to some of these foods, think about low levels of diamine oxidase as being a reason for that, not just a sensitivity or an allergy. 
aged cheeses are high in histamine. Any food that is older is high in histamine because as a food degrades, as a food ripens, as a food ages, it begins to produce more histamine. So when you are faced with that clinically confusing picture of a patient saying to you, I know it's not this particular food because I ate that food yesterday and I didn't have a problem, well, it might not be the food itself, but as the food ages, ripens, and degrades, it begins to produce more histamine. And so it can be the, the varying levels of histamine that are reactive to, not exactly the food itself things that are fermented, and so sauerkraut or kimchi, which we would often think about as providing good levels for our microbiome, um, for helping to, to establish good flora, being something that's good for the gut. So if we see an opposite presentation, if we see that, that something that should be good for the gut, like kimchi or sauerkraut or kombucha, but they react negatively, think about that fermentation and during fermentation also more histamine is produced and this can be a reason for reaction. Wines, champagne, uh, very high in uh, histamine and so if people get headaches for example from red wine which is higher in histamine versus white wine again another clinical clue that probably they have difficulty degrading histamine uh, <clears throat> when we compare it from one wine to the other uh, the one that's higher in histamine gives them problems this lets us know that there might be an issue in terms of their levels of diamine oxidase so when we biopsy the gut of Crohn's patients we also see uh, lower levels of diamine oxidase demonstrating its, its presentation in various pathologies of the gut but not limited to the gut. Another point about diamine oxidase is that there are many medications that can inhibit diamine oxidase. And this is an important point because when we're looking why people are more allergic or more sensitive or why their presentation has changed, finding out <clears throat> if onset was after uh, introduction of particular medications uh, can be quite useful. It also demonstrates some other points. So for example, amitriptyline on the bottom, but also SSRIs um, can inhibit diamine oxidase. So when we think about that, we would take an SSRI in order to increase serotonin to combat conditions like depression or anxiety. Yet, at the same time, now the medication inhibits diamine oxidase, so we don't degrade histamine as well. When there's more histamine, there's more inflammation in the body. More inflammation in the body blocks the body's ability to take dietary protein uh, and, and break, it, break it down into tryptophan, and it blocks the ability to convert that tryptophan into serotonin. So on one hand, while the medication is helping to build levels of serotonin, on the other hand, it's creating more of an inflammatory load that can block our body from making our own. And so as we wean patients or as we're looking for strategies to lower doses of medication and hopefully return them to optimal or, or homeostasis, uh, one of the things that we need to consider is using strategies to increase diamine oxidase to lower the inflammatory load. We can use supplements of diamine oxidase alongside things like SSRIs to offset some of the inflammatory potential they're causing. So we know that when there's an ischemic event to the, to the gut, uh, diamine oxidase will go down. Uh, this again helps us to understand when there's an assault to the gut, we don't make diamine oxidase as well, we won't degrade histamine as well, and we'll have more, more issues in terms of a histaminosis. We know conditions like eczema uh, are also associated with low diamine oxidase. And so when we work to, to treat that, yes, we can remove high histamine foods, but we should also work on the gut lining to build more higher levels of diamine oxidase to help with this degradation. And some people have SNPs or polymorphisms in their ability to make diamine oxidase. Some conditions where you might see that, um, uh, food allergies, gluten. Another big one is autism. 
And so uh, when we're thinking about some of our key strategies for autism, we would think back to treatment of the gut uh, and helping in terms of um, things like uh, secretin therapies or glutamine, uh, different probiotics, but also consider low diamine oxidase as a reason for more gut inflammation. Yes, in conditions like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but also in autism. So we know when the gut becomes more permeable, things leak through and this can trigger a mast cell to degranulate and to release more histamine. However, in addition to that, uh, we would also um, know that another reason that people can become more reactive is as the gut lining is worn down, the microvilli begins to be eroded and we produce less diamine oxidase. Diamine oxidase is continuously released from intestinal mucosa and it is carried to circulation by the lymphatics. This is American Journal of Physiology and it demonstrates that this is why uh, we can see it in the serum. Even though it's made in the gut, um, it will get disseminated through the rest of the body through lymph channels. This also talks about one of the ways that we can increase movement of diamine oxidase from the gut to the rest of the body systemically. Uh, it moves more with fats. So this is another reason for dosing of our omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids will help diamine oxidase to move more fluidly into circulation and our omega-3 fatty acids will strengthen the membrane of mast cells preventing degranulation. Another mechanism of fish oil is that it helps the microvilli to recover. And so when there are higher levels of uh, omega-3 fatty acids, we see the microvilli plump back up and we see them recover their ability to make this brush border enzyme diamine oxidase. And so we know that this, this is one more way that our omega-3 fatty acids provide um, an anti-inflammatory mechanism for us. Saccharomyces will also increase your levels of diamine oxidase. So clinically, when we think about ways to increase diamine oxidase, Saccharomyces, omega-3 fatty acids, immunoglobulins, such as those that are sourced from eggs, eggs or those that are sourced from colostrum. We also know that B5 and uh, B6 and vitamin C are cofactors for diamine oxidase. And so we can use these as strategies to increase our levels of diamine oxidase. Plasma levels of DAO are useful for measuring um, uh, to uh, GI tract toxicities. So what they saw in this study was that um, when they gave fluorouracil that it caused more uh, nausea and, and that often can limit people's ability to receive the therapy. Uh, the people that had the most trouble were people that had low levels of diamine oxidase. And so by helping people with levels of diamine oxidase, we can also help them with some of the nausea that can come from chemotherapy. Low diamine oxidase is associated with headaches. So one of the strategies that I've seen to be successful for some of the most aggressive migraines is to take <clears throat> a higher dose of diamine oxidase right at the onset of a headache um, using Diamine oxidase, I'll typically use uh, four capsules of diamine oxidase at the onset of a headache and seen many people have relief with this. Here we see our patient KF and she had chronic hives and gut issues and she was only maintained on prednisone. We looked at her levels of diamine oxidase and then this is when, after we'd worked on increasing levels of diamine oxidase. You see you can monitor it in the serum and it goes up quite nicely. Here's what she looked like uh, pre and post treatment. And as her levels of diamine oxidase went up, she was able to finally back down prednisone. She was able to finally get off the prednisone. Her gut felt better, her energy was better, and as she reported, this is the first time I feel better, not worse, I have hope. Low levels of diamine oxidase will lead to a condition known as histaminosis. <clears throat> when there's an abundance of histamine, yes, it can create rashes or shortness of breath or a runny nose, but higher levels of histamine 
can also affect us in our brain and in our heart and, and, and will just increase the inflammatory potential in general. So by measuring diamine oxidase, not only can we assess the mucosal lining and make sure that the mucosal lining is strong, uh, understanding that permeability uh, is less, but also we have a cogent therapy for decreasing inflammation and helping people to become less reactive to the environment around us. Some of our harder patients are the ones that tend to react to everything. Low levels of diamine oxidase can be a reason for that. And low levels of diamine oxidase can be measured, tracked, and they're actionable. Therapies that improve the gut lining will improve levels of diamine oxidase and will give our patients much relief.